to the road door. We raise the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to grow with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Are uh, you real to real listeners? Uh, today we have Shaheen. I always find it so funny. So we like, and I brought this up before, is we talk a little before we get on camera and then just start going at it. And I know Shaheen was just about to say something. He's like, oh, I like the beard. And then I, I just went live. I just cut it off and just went live. My, my fiance says I'm so bad about that, especially on hanging up phone calls, picking up phone calls and then hanging up too quick. They're about to say something. I go, oh. Gotta hang up. I, I gotta. I guess I gotta give it a little bit longer to let the conversation slowly die out, and then push play. Thank you. Sometimes Shane. that happens, but sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's just the right time, right? If you're a believer in that kind of stuff. Yeah, everything works out for a reason. Is that kind of the idea? Kind of, yeah. And also, just you know, you gotta fucking have thick skin in life, right? If you let little shit like that get to you, it's like. You know, I'll give you an example. So we had a guy on my podcast. So I, I do a podcast called Hack and Grow Rich, where we teach people how to create predictable revenue streams, recurring revenue, that kind of thing. And we teach all kinds of hacks. And we have people on that are hackers in their department. So we're, we've had like uh, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, Chris Voss, the FBI negotiator. We've had uh, all kinds of people from all areas of business on. And we had a guest uh, last night, which I was like, Oh dude, like, do I really want to have this guy on? I don't know. But you know, my co-host thought it was a good idea. So we get the guy on the phone and you know, I just mispronounce his name. That's all I did. Enrique. Like I was just like, I mispronounced his name. And the first thing he said to me is I'm going to kick your butt. Oh, and wow. I was like, I was like, dude, <laughs> and you know, we both just shrugged it off. Cause you know, uh, and, and I'm sure you're the same way, especially in the business that, that you're in. It's like, you know, the first thing you got to learn, I think, you know, is that people have all kinds of issues and it's rarely about you. So, you know, if somebody, you know, goes off on you for no reason, you know, that's about them. That's not about you. So we had him, we had him on the show anyway, and it was kind of a, you know, it was kind of a weird show, which just kind of goes to show that you got to trust your intuition, which from this point forward, I am much more trusting my intuition, but it was, it was one of those things. It was, it was several great lessons learned, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't let stuff get to you. You can't let the bastards grind you down in life. Otherwise you'd get nowhere, right? You'd sell no houses if every time you, you walked in and somebody said, no, I'm not interested, right? I, I, the two two ideas to that concept that changed the way I looked at it. The first one was I'm not as important as I think I am, right? Mm. If I'm talking to someone and they turn me down or they yell at me or whatever it might be. Yeah, like you said, it's not me. It's basically they're going through something and, you know I mean? It is what it is, right? And the other one is someone's do they're doing the best they can with the tools they have, right? So maybe they're angry, they're frustrated, but they don't have the outlets or the, the skill set to basically eloquently talk about their feelings. And so that's, that's right. the way of doing it is lashing out. So yeah, that's right. But it's the perseverance, right? Especially I always have a deep respect for real estate brokers because you know, if you don't kill, you don't eat. And that's really, you know, that takes cajones. Like that really takes balls to go out there. And it's not, not everybody's cut out for it, right? What is it? Like one in a hundred of like people that want to try that business, like actually make it. Well, in San Diego County, a crazy stat with, I mean, COVID, I mean, it's not as bad usually, but with COVID that I think it's 85% of realtors, right? In the last 12 months, haven't sold a piece of business. In San Diego County, eighty-five percent. So you're saying only fifteen percent. And mind you, yeah, twenty percent is doing eighty percent of the business. But still, it's a crazy number that eighty-five percent haven't done a single piece of business. So it's like you're talking about that perseverance. If you're one of those people that hasn't sold anything for a year, how are you feeding your family? I mean, mm. so uh, yeah. But, but I mean, real estate. I mean, I'd rather get yelled at than being on being that old guy pouring con or laying concrete, you know, and just like tearing up your body all day long in the construction fields. And so there's yeah. a lot harder jobs out there than basically getting yelled at every day. I'd, shit, I'd do that every single day. Yeah. But. Yeah. It's a numbers game, you know, and 
there there's a personality style that's right for it and i think you know if you can thrive in that business which effectively at some point becomes door to door sales like yeah. fucking vacuum cleaner sales is not that much different like we see the old salesman who like you know sticks his foot in the door and tosses a cup of dirt and like people are yeah. like oh what the fuck you do and he goes in with the vacuum and makes the sale like it's a few steps removed from that but it's the same level of gumption and like stick to itiveness that makes people successful in in your industry uh, and you know and it's those people that are thriving as opposed to the other people that are like yeah you know they're making excuses oh yeah there's there's always an excuse always an excuse i mean i had a gun pulled out at me when i'm door knocking but that's a that's a story <laughs> for for another time you know let's let's talk about you and and your business i mean so you've leveraged amazon and i think you have over was it like 200 and some products that you've sold through amazon correct so we have over 300 products that we sell ourselves okay. and from our companies that we represent as a agency we've got over 5000 different products wow. or, or asins that we sell on the amazon platform so understanding amazon is at the core of your business then i'm guessing right yeah so i've got three areas of business right now so my first area of business is that we make great stuff and we sell it on the Amazon platform as a seller. The second area of business is we do that. People came to us and we're like, Hey, you guys are killing it on Amazon. Can you do this for us? And we said, yeah, we're going to charge some ridiculous amount of money. And they said done. And we were like, Oh, okay. Now we got to do the work. So we started doing that and our business grew by word of mouth, never advertised. So we represent a fortune 50, some fortune 500s, a bunch of startups that VCs bring us because most people have no idea how to sell the products that they make. And we are experts at that on in one specific area, which is e-commerce. And if you go even more specific selling on Amazon, and then the third area is I run a course where I teach people from all areas of life, how to create predictable recurring revenue on Amazon. You start up an Amazon business. We teach you how to find a product. We teach you how to market it and how to sell it and you know for very little money and little time expenditure in comparison to other businesses you have another foundational pillar of recurring revenue which is what we talk about and you know i teach this in my course and i teach this you know all over the world is that you have to build foundations for success so success doesn't come in like it's not like a casino right where you're like you you roll the dice or you know you put that wheel in the thing and hope it runs on your number. The way that it works is, is that you build different foundations. So if you, if you, if you think of it as, as building a building, right? One foundation should always be cash flow real estate. Another one should be the markets. You should be invested in the markets in one way or another. Another one should be an e-commerce business. And maybe a fourth one should be whatever feeds your family in the moment while you are perfecting those other four foundations. And when you have that type of foundation built, then nothing can shake you. You know, nothing shakes you at all because you wake up and even if there's bad news in one of those sectors, it's rare that all four would go down. So you can be fairly stable and live a really good life as long as you're well balanced. Let's rewind a little bit. Do you remember the first product you ever sold on Amazon? Yeah, yeah. So we can go back even further. You know, I started in the early 1990s and I was a teenager. I left home at 15, dropped out of school, didn't even go to high school. And I went out on my own. And to make a long story short, I invented probably one of the most recognized rave drugs of the time called herbal ecstasy or ecstasy. And it was legal and I found distribution for it. And I remember waking up one morning, going into my office in Venice. We had about 200 employees. I had gone from sleeping in abandoned buildings in the back of cars to 200 employees. And the news had broke that we had just broke the billion dollar mark in revenue pre-internet. There was no internet. There was no mobile smartphone type thing. It was all analog and we had broken a billion dollars. And I remember thinking to myself, holy shit, I don't know how much a billion dollars is. And I had a panic. I was like, dude, what? Like someone needs to tell me now, you know, the CNN wanted to have me on. I was going to be on with Sam Donaldson. He was driving over to the office to have me on Nightline. 
And I was, I was anxious because I didn't know how much a billion dollars was. That was my level of sophistication at that time. And so that was a wild journey. I wrote about it in my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Poke Cult. Anybody that wants to check it out, there's the first chapter is uh, available on Stitcher or Spotify as an as a audio book. Um, and we're going to release sometime in August. We're, we're in negotiations now with uh, some big studios um, about the uh, film rights and about producing a, a major motion picture based on the book. But, um, you know, from there, I went on to developing all the technology that became digital vaporization. So all the vapes that you see now, all that multi-billion dollar industry came out of technology that I patented, invented, I wrote books on and proliferated. And my company there, that company went public sometime around 2007. I exited just a little before in 2006 and I was looking for the next thing to do. And I thought to myself, wow, uh, let me get back into supplements. So I, uh, the, the actor Bradley Cooper, you ever see that film Limitless? Yeah. So funny story was that he was at my house in Venice chilling out and we were talking about like nootropics and, you know, all these cool things. And, you know, I didn't, you know, see him for a while after that. And then he made that film Limitless, which was really cool. And simultaneously, I had tried to make a Limitless pill, this product called Accelerol. And I was looking for a way to distribute it. And we got an invitation um, from uh, Amazon, you know, that they run very closely by Jeff Bezos, that they're opening it up to third party sellers. And so I thought, eh, you know what, let's give it a shot. What's, you know, what could it hurt? Let me put it up on there. And so I put it up, went to sleep, woke up in the morning, thousands of orders. And it was an expensive supplement, you know, it was 120 bucks a month, something like that, 129 a month. And it was, it was thousands of orders with zero work. We just put a few pictures up, put a little description up and it just blow, blew up. So I was like, all right, stop everything that we're doing. This is the new game in town. This is going to be bigger than, than anything. And so we started focusing on Amazon and learning all the ins and outs, learning about their A9 algorithm or whatever algorithm it was at that time and mastering the language that you have to speak to sell on Amazon. And that's really, I think, in any of these areas of business like yours or mine where you are dependent on how well you can influence others learning the language that you need to be able to speak to that specific niche is going to be the difference between succeeding and failing so i'm sure in in your industry um enriquez i'm sure in your industry there's a certain language and over the many years that you've become a master uh, agent, broker, selling properties, you've mastered that language. You know how to sell a property. You know, hey, I got to get this photographer and take these angles of shots. And I know I've got to write this kind of copy, you know, and I, I always get a chuckle out of the way you guys write copy for, uh, for properties. It's just, it's hilarious. Um, but you've got to write a certain amount of copy. And then there's a certain way you got to talk to buyers, a certain way you got to talk to sellers. And there's, there's an art to it. Uh, am I wrong? No, you're, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, and, and the ones that are really good, like yourself, that excel at what you do, the reason why you have so many sales and you were, you were telling me what, what percentage of, uh, of brokers don't have a single sale in 85% uh, don't have a single sale, right? It's like, uh, it reminds me of that, uh, scene in, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Did you ever see that movie? <laughs> Where the guy's like, put the fucking coffee down. And the guy's just standing. He's like kind of old and curmudgeonly salesman in his tweed suit. And he's like, why? He's like, because coffee's for fucking closers. You don't deserve coffee. And it's, uh, it, it's such a great scene. That was such a great movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, the, mo most, the majority of people live lives of mediocrity. And they're, they're okay with that. They're okay with just being inertial. And hopefully some crumbs will fall down and they'll do okay. And then you've got a small amount of people that seek excellence and they will go out there and they will do whatever it takes to succeed. And that's really, you know, where I get excited when I find people like that and I can bring them into this Amazon ecosphere, which gives us all the tools we need to make money and show them, hey, you know, th here, here's the keys to the kingdom. Here's the language that you need to be able to speak for Amazon. And it takes about 30 to 90 days to learn how to do that. But once you learn, oh my God, you, you would be amazed at, it's like being handed that goose that's like laying the golden eggs. You're like, 
really? Is it that easy to sell stuff on Amazon? It's like, yeah, you didn't, you know, you didn't believe me, you know? So it's, it's pretty amazing. Okay. So let's rewind. All right. So you come from Iran, uh, at the age of five, you leave your house, you run away from your house at the age of 15. You start the company at 15 or when did you start the, yeah. that first company? Okay. Yeah. 15. Sorry. Right. Roughly around 15, 16, around there. Okay. So you ran away. Why did you run away and start the company at the same time? Was it a conflict event? I mean, what, what was going on there? You know, I don't know if I ran away. I think I just decided to go out and seek fame and fortune. You know, I, okay. I wasn't getting that at home. Right. Because usually you have a set path in life. And unless that path is disrupted, you will have a tendency to go for wherever inertia will take you. Most kids these days, I mean, look at 15 year olds now, right? They don't, I mean, they don't know how to wipe their own butts, much less like go out there and start a company, right? I, I, do you have any kids? No. Okay. So most kids, like I've got nephews who I just look at and I'm like, oh my God, like they're, you know, I've got uh, one nephew who's in his teens and I really would like him to be more proactive. Like he is far from starting a business. I was like, when I, by the time I was 16, I had like hundreds of people working for me. I was running shit back then. I had multiple fake IDs so I could just go out to like bars and restaurants and have business meetings because I was too young to get into those kinds of places. So I think, you know, I was ahead of my time at that age. And I think it felt like the world wasn't ready for me in the state that I came in. So I needed to have a major life disruption. And I went out there and I seeked mentors. I write about it in my book. I came across a mentor, a guy who really influenced and affected my life in a big way and taught me about business and taught me about influence and how to really navigate the world in a way where it doesn't matter what color your skin is, what, you know, where you come from, what, like none of that stuff matters at the end of the day, if you can master a few simple skills. And that's what I did. And even, you know, not having any money, which, you know, from, for a lot of people seemed seemingly, you know, debilitating, you know, for me, it was just another challenge. It was exciting. That was the most exciting time in my life, you know, hands down. And people are like, well, you didn't have anywhere to sleep. I'm like, I slept on the beach. What difference does it make? I woke up in the morning, <laughs> took a shower on the beach, and then I went and I did, you know, whatever, whatever work I needed to do. I was, I, I, yeah, I was never poor. I was broke. That was the yeah. difference. I, I just had someone on my, actually my last interview was, uh, she's 19 years old. She started her app at the age of 12 and kind of, and she was, she used her family almost as kind of, uh, a support system to kind of grow her her business and her brand it seems like you went the almost the opposite direction basically needed that that big shake up to really allow yourself to to grow yet it does it sounds like you did have some kind of support system there uh how did you find those people to put around you you know i think uh, they, there's an old adage that says when the student is ready the teacher appears okay and for me it was really that you know, I had a unshakable self-belief really for no good reason. And I went out there and I was not going to fail. There was nothing that was going to keep me down for very long. And so I went out there to kick ass and take names and all the right people were attracted to me and some of the wrong people. When you're young, people take advantage of you and that's fine but mostly the right people and i utilize their skill sets and their teachings to improve myself and that's what mentorship is all about so you know i encourage anybody who you know is in any industry you know one of the easiest ways to create your next level of growth or success is to like me discover someone who is where you want to be and see if you can get them to mentor you bring some value to them, work for free for them, you know, give them money, pay them with something, do something to get them to mentor you. And if you can do that, you get the biggest shortcut there that was ever written. Okay. You're 15. You have a will, a want to do something yet. How do you come up with the idea or how do you come up with even the ability to build that 
vitamin that you originally came out with. Yeah. So herbal ecstasy, that's awesome. Well, I was introduced to the EDM electronic music scene, okay. which in the early nineties was booming everywhere you went <laughs> electronic music raves were huge. So I realized that these parties started around 2 AM and went until six in the morning. Perfect place to sleep. I love the drone of a speaker. You can just go behind the speaker and crash out. So I would sneak into these parties and I would crash out behind the speakers and it was spectacular. I'd sleep like a baby. I'd wake up. You know, it was amazing because I didn't have anywhere to go. And I started to watch the business of the electronic music scene. And I was like, hmm, who's making the money? Okay. Or the people who throw in the clubs, surely they're making the money. The promoters. Nope. Those guys were always broke. They actually went negative. It was an ego thing for them. Okay. So the promoters weren't making the money. I got it. It's got to be the DJs. Nope. The DJs are always standing out with their hands. Hey, man, why hasn't anybody paid me? Why isn't nobody cares after the service is done? It's called the call girl principles. Uh, the, the value of any goods or service greatly diminishes once those goods and services have been delivered. Mm -hmm. So based on the call girl principle, they were always standing outside with their hands out wondering why nobody had paid them. So I thought, okay, it must be the real estate, the people who own the buildings. No, most of those buildings were break-ins. Most of them were, you know, somebody who got a key to an old warehouse and, you know, kind of got in there. So I started to think to myself, but these happen every week, every single week, week after week. Who is making the money? And so I started looking around and I noticed that there was a few people that were always smiling, always at the door. You know, they gave some money to the DJs. They gave some money to the promoters. They kind of were like, you know, the Don Corleones of the electronic music scene. Who do you think those people were? The drug dealers. That's right. You're the first guy who's gotten that right. I think out of 112 podcasts that I've done <laughs> this last year, you're the first guy that got it right. None of them guess. So exactly right. It was the drug dealers and those guys were making money left and right. Now I thought to myself, you know, I came from a, uh, you know, a relatively conservative, poor Jewish family, which comes with its own level of neurosis. And I thought to myself, you know, dude, I would be really fucking bad at crime. Like crime would, I just don't understand how people do crime because I would be nervous thinking about it every second of the day. So I thought, you know, I like this drug business. It's making money, but the whole crime element of it won't really serve me. I don't have that makeup to do crime. Being a criminal just would not be my thing. It's a bad look. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I love watching Scarface. I'd love to be in my mansion with like powder all over my face, shooting a gun down the stairs while some babe soaks in the jacuzzi. But really, I don't have the stomach for crime. So I thought to myself, you know what? There's got to be a way where I can create a legal version of this drug. Now, being at the right place at the right time, we talk about synchronicity, intuition, going out there, stick to itiveness. I thought to myself, there's got to be a way where I can make a legal version of this, this drug. And at just at that time, the supply of ecstasy, which was very difficult to synthesize, Molly, MDMA, whatever you call it at that time, um, was it dried up. The DEA shut down all the supplies coming in and out. There were drug wars. You know, it was in the middle of the big drug war, war on drugs. And the drug dealers had nothing to sell. So I walked into the clubs as a teenage kid and I said, hey, guys, I made this stuff. Uh, it's just as good as ecstasy. Give it a shot. And they turned around and looked at me and smiled and said, fuck off. And then I said, you know, well, you got no option. And just, just like you do with real estate, I kept going from one guy to the next. And finally, one dude said, yeah. He said, I'll try it. And he sold out. And we made $10,000 that night. And he said, can you get more? And I thought to myself, holy shit, now I got to go make more. And so I went home and I made more. And then finally, we got a small operation going where we were making it in Chinatown. And then we expanded and we got bigger operation. It went from one guy to 10 guys to 1,000 guys to 100,000 guys to that morning when I'm stumbling into an office. We're in 32,000 retail stores, Urban Outfitters. You remember Tower Records? Yeah. We, used, we, we, we kept Tower Records in business for the last few years because nobody was buying CDs and records, but they were buying Herbal Ecstasy, Urban Outfitters, GNC, 7-Eleven. We were everywhere. 
And then it brings me to that morning where I walk into the office and I get this news that we made, a, we broke a billion dollars in revenue. Where did you learn the, the mixture of how to put the mixture together? Where did that come that, from? I made that shit up as I went along. You know, yeah. it's, it's, they say there's three things that you need. And this, you know, this comes from uh, my good friend and mentor, Wayne Boss, who's a, he's an Australian multimillionaire. I think he's a billionaire. Nobody knows, but he uh, made his fortune, came from nothing also. And he made his fortune turning uh, troubled companies. So he comes in and buys, buys these companies, buys these assets and turns them around. He's a master at doing that masterful guy. And he says, he taught me that there's three things that you need knowledge courage and action knowledge you can buy you can borrow you can steal you can rent right maybe better not to steal it but you can rent it you can hire people and that's what i did i picked up the phone the first phone call i made was to andrew wilde the great uh naturopath the guy who wrote all the textbooks who's like uh now you know he's got a tv show he's got books you know keynote speaker whatever and i said hey i want to make this herbal version of ecstasy. Can you help me? And he said, yeah, sure. And he gave me contacts and told me about herbs. And then I went down to Chinatown. And I found some herbalists and I said, Hey, I don't have any money, but I know herbs don't cost very much. Can you front me some herbs? And they said, sure. And you know, it, everything started coming together. So that's knowledge. I borrowed it. I rented it. I bought it whatever, to figure out what I'm doing. I knew nothing about doing that stuff. I was just making it up as I went along. And we tried so many different formulas. It started off as like five bags of like these round goo balls, like gumballs that you had to like pop down and it worked. I mean, it got you really high, but it tasted nasty. And most people got a stomach ache. And then we finally got it down and we got rid of the stomach ache and we got it into capsules and you had to eat 20 capsules. And then finally, after a couple of years, we got it down to five small pills and you could choose, you could take one or you could choose five, depending on where you wanted to be in life. And so that's knowledge, right? But when you have the knowledge, that gives you the courage. Right? If we don't know stuff, then it's hard for us to move in life. If you don't know what you're going to do when the client says yes, you're like, holy shit. But if you know you're going to walk up to that door in your business, in the real estate business, and they say, you say, hey, I, I can get you top dollar for this house. And they say yes. And you're like, great, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to list it on the MLS. I'm going to advertise in this. I'm going to make it a pocket list. I'm going to do, you've got that knowledge. That gives you courage. That gives you balls. That gives you cojones, right? That's what, that's what you need. And all that, that knowledge and that courage gives you the ability to do the third thing, to jump off that ledge with a parachute, to take action. And that third element of action, nothing is possible without it. So you have to take the action. And that's what I did. I got the knowledge that gave me the courage to move forward, to walk into a, a club and approach a, a relatively dangerous human being, uh, somebody who's dealing illicit narcotics for a living and probably has been to jail and had face tattoos before face tattoos were cool and walk up to the dude and be like, Hey man, take a risk on me. This little, you know, shit faced long hair kid that's gonna, you know, change, change history. So what, okay. I, I know you brought up the idea of picking the phone and today it's a lot easier. I mean, you can go on Twitter, you can go on Instagram, you can basically Google someone's name and, and try to find a number with little Lego right there. When you found that, that first person, was it yellow pages, word of mouth and where did you find the contact for that person? Or was it through Chi Chinatown or just going through stores to store or where did you go? So it was all of that. I just picked up the phone. Right. And I was, where did you get the number from? So originally I, I went to the library and I was reading books and most people don't know this. So this is a life hack. I teach this on my course often. You know, if you're reading a book, authors are very lonely people. Most people don't know this. You read a book, you get to know the author. You're like, man, this guy's famous. He's in a world of whatever. Dude, it's usually three phone calls to get through to any author, including mm -hmm. New York Times bestsellers. They're not that hard to find, to find their emails and phone numbers and just call them. And back then, pre-internet, it was even easier. So I just called 411, you know? <laughs> back then, you would call this number, 411. They'd give you the number of yeah. anybody who was listed, or you can go to the Yellow Pages or whatever. And we had microfish at the libraries. So I did some research. I got people's phone numbers, and I would call them. 
I would get them on the other end of the line. And if they said, I can't help you, I'd be like, great. Who do you know who can? And I would go from one person to the next to the next fearless. I didn't know I could fail. It was, it was more likely that I would fail than succeed, but I didn't know I could fail. And I went after it with that attitude and eventually I made it. You know, most people, a lot of people ask me that. That's a, it's an interesting, like, how did you know how to come up with that? That wasn't even the question. Like somebody knows how to come up with that. I'm going to find that person and hire them to do it for me. Easy. That's yeah. not the hard part. The hard part is always finding the market for it, the distribution, which is the key. Life is about distribution in any business, yours, mine, or any other. So going to the hard part, do you think that was your your biggest hurdle, biggest struggle is distribution of your, your product? Or what was, what was that big? Because everything we've kind of talked about has been kind of very confident. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. It's going to work. And before you knew it, you had basically... I mean, what, I think you said what two hundred employees. Yeah, that time? I, I, yeah. I write about it in the book here. Check it out. I don't know if you can see. You yeah. do your podcast on video, right? Yeah. So that's me when I was in my early twenties, and yeah. that's a photo taken by a very famous photographer, this guy David LaChapelle, in a castle in New York. And that was, you know, kind of this this picture. I love this picture because it kind of sums up those days and those times, you know, of of how I lived back in those days. But, if you're if you're listening and not watching the the visual component of it, it's a castle and he's sitting on what looks like a green and red or pink chair with like a very bright color outfit on. It's very it grabs your attention. Grabs it's your a attention. throne, yeah. If you guys want, you know, again, go go check out Billion: How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. It's on Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Amazon podcast, anywhere where your podcasts are found. The first chapter is on there and it's free and live and the book comes out in August again. So the question I think that, that you were asking is how do you, how did I, how did I know what to put to? No, no. What's, what was the struggle? It seems very fluid. Oh, that, hey, I, I, you know what? I know what I want. I'm going to make money. You found a product. You basically go, okay, here, here, here. It seems very fluid. Yet I'm assuming there was some stuff that was like, oh my gosh, I got, I'm racking yeah, my yeah, brain. Oh yeah. Well, you realize that the product is in its original form is no longer on the market. The reason for that is that every three letter agency came after us. So it's an interesting story. I'll tell you this story since you asked, and I don't usually tell this story. So in the 1980s, People were really interested in psychoanalysis and psychiatry, and doctors were very freely prescribing a very specific drug called Prozac. Do you remember Prozac? Yeah. Okay. Prozac is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So what it, what it does is it blocks the reuptake of serotonin so that you could presumably have more serotonin in your brain. I'm probably, <coughs> excuse me, messing this up um, from a science perspective. I'm sure some scientists would be able to give us a much better description of that. But as far as the herbal XC guy goes, I'm giving a fucking hell of a description. So these guys came up with this drug and it was the number one drug like for 10 years. Right? I think like between 1980 and 1990. Now, as these baby boomers coming off Prozac and into the 1990s began to notice, there was one remarkable side effect to this magical drug. You're, you're, you're one and one right now, buddy. What do you think that side effect was? Well, some kind of withdrawals, my guess. Um, close, close. It made your ding ding go ling ling. So, oh, okay. Erectile dysfunction, um, disinterest in sexual activity. You know, there were other side effects, but that was probably one of the ones that was most embarrassing for the baby boomers. Mm. But Enrique, don't worry. And am I pronouncing your name correctly? Forgive me if I miss. It, it, it's my last name, Enriquez, but first name's uh, go by Vinny. Oh, just you just go by Vinny. Okay, yeah. cool. So Vinny, this company who makes this stuff was so kind that they had a solution ready, Vinny. And can you guess what that solution was? 
what is that blue pill? It's a what blue vitamin, this? Vinny, called Viagra. Oh, Vi there we Problem go. solved, buddy. Can't get it up. You're not available for date night tonight with the wife. Don't worry. They have a solution for you. And this was going to be the blockbuster drug of the decade. An answer to all the problems of that baby boomer generation that may or may not allegedly have had complications from that other drug that they were taking. Now, pharma business wasn't great. It was getting more and more expensive to do clinical trials and to release these medications, these drugs. Every year it got more expensive. And coinciding with that, the effectiveness and the efficacy of placebo just shot up like to some crazy number. I think it was like 70% plus, which just completely fucked up all of their results and studies as well. So everything is getting more expensive. Things are getting more complicated. Nobody's understanding why placebos in a lot of cases are working better than the drugs themselves. Like everything is fucked up. Those guys are not happy and they're dropping billions and billions of dollars. Their share value is going down. Holy fuck, they're in a tough place. But here comes this hero drug, the savior drug. You buy it, you get a boner, life is good, right? If you boner more than four hours, you know, call your doctor. I remember those commercials. Well, here comes this teenage kid with an equally effective blue pill, which you don't need a prescription for. There's no shame in buying it. It's available at Tower Records where you go to buy your CDs or you can call an 800 number and we'll deliver it to your door. And it is unregulated. There is no clinical trials required. We are at market before they're on market. And people are taking it and raving about it. Not only that, the government doesn't seem to care because it is a supplement like any other supplement. Now, if you were a different man and working for one of these companies, what would your level of concern be about this teenage kid with long hair sitting on a throne selling a billion dollars of pills after you know what you know? Yeah, get a, find some way to get rid of them. Correct. So the pharma company along with lobbyists got together and they, you know, got with the government. And before I knew it, I was spending hundreds of millions of dollars in attorney's fees. And I had, you know, one hippie attorney on staff, the guy like lived in a house with like chickens underneath it. And I like was thumbing my nose at the government and it led to a, a several year long battle against the government. And you know, you just don't win those battles because the government always has more money than you. And that's what happened. I came out of it a better person. I came out of it with some amount of cash, but nowhere near the billions of dollars of revenue that that company generated or the billion dollar of revenue that that company generated. But it was a very interesting and exciting time. You've transitioned... I mean, your your business from, I guess, building a product and building a brand to, I guess, still building a brand, but also teaching and helping people grow their own business. Do you do you recall why you transitioned over or do you know who you, how you changed in life to to want to switch that direction? Yeah. So let me ask you this. What is the definition of freedom for you? Uh. I think the freedom to, oh well, yeah, the ability to do what you want to do, I guess. I guess that'd probably be the easiest way to describe it. I think you're three and three today. I, I should be giving you a toaster or a prize or something. <laughs> so that's absolutely right. It's the ability to do what you want, where you want, when you want, with who you want. That's freedom. That's all that matters. Time is the new luxury. It's not money. It's the ability to do what you want. I can do anything I want right now. My finances are at a place where I'm good. 
I own a ton of real estate. I own several companies. I've got my foundation set up. My assets are very well protected. I've got a beautiful family, a beautiful wife and son. And, you know, we travel the world all the time. And while we are sleeping, we are creating revenue, predictable revenue on the Amazon platform. So I don't need to teach in order to make money. My companies generate plenty of money. And in fact, I could retire now. I could have retired 20 years ago if I wanted to. But the reason why I do it is because I get a buzz out of impacting other people. And there's no better way to impact other people than to give them the tools they need to succeed. And Amazon really enables the ability to do that. So for anybody on your show, with your permission, yeah. um, I've got a one hour course that teaches you everything you need to know from A to Z. It's normally 200 bucks for listeners of the road to growth, use the code growth. And I will give you that one hour crash course absolutely for free. It's a $200 value. Just go to fbasellercourse.com and fill out the form and I'll send it to you. Alternatively, you can always email me. That email is going to be D-A-R-K-Z-E-S-S -S at gmail.com. I answer all emails personally and I'd be happy to send that to you. And if anybody is interested in, you know, learning further how you could sell on Amazon. I do have a course, but you have to take the one hour course first to see if you qualify for that. We've, we've talked about transition. We talked about from building your business to a billion dollars. Uh, and then this kind of training programs you go, go through, you brought up a little bit about the idea that you're looking to, I guess, in the process of putting together a movie, if, we were talking, let's say in five years from now, I guess, besides the movie being out, what other, other things are you going to be doing your company be doing? Yeah. Five, so in five years from now, well, the film will be out. Definitely. Yeah. The film will be out. The book certainly will be out by August. So that's exciting. And I think I'll be doing the same thing I'm doing now, you know, uh, going around the world, lecturing, speaking, doing shows with people that I respect like yourself, Vinny, and being able to create many more millionaires through Amazon or whatever it is at the time. We don't just teach Amazon. We take our systems and we apply them to Etsy, to eBay, to Walmart, to selling in brick and mortar. We just got a deal now with 99 cent only and dollar general. And so we teach how to speak the language of sales, the language of influence. And once you know how to do that, it doesn't matter which park you're playing in, right? It's like playing basketball. Like once you know how to play basketball, it doesn't matter which court you're playing on. It's basketball. You just need to have those skills of how to dribble, how to shoot, how to do all that stuff. And so I see myself empowering people and, you know, empowering my family, empowering myself, uh, empowering others around me to create these recurring predictable revenue systems that never fail. And it's very possible now. If, if you were talking to your younger self, that 15 year old kid that just left their house or maybe someone else that's, that's listening right now and they just left their house, what kind of advice would you give? If any, I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think if I was talking to myself at 15, I think I would say seek mentorship as soon as you can and seek several mentors and then seek out those who've done what you want to do and get them to mentor you sign up for their course do whatever it is that they've done and follow that trajectory and then add what's uniquely your own and by doing that you can create a success. You know, I, I have no doubt if somebody really puts their heart to it, that if you wanted to go work for Bill Gates, you probably could. Maybe you'd have to start the mailroom at Microsoft. Maybe you'd have to start at the coffee shop across the street from Microsoft. But eventually, you could get in there. If you wanted to work for Elon Musk, you could do that. I don't think there's any limits to what you can do. And I think, you know, looking back at the younger me, I think that's what I would tell him. I, I think it would depend on what period of time, right? The period of time where I started my business would be a different thing than, than at the beginning. But in general, it would be seek out mentors, seek out people who've done what you want to do. And then always take care of your body. That's another thing. You got to work out. Super important. I, I neglected that, Vinny, 
when I was really young because I was so busy making money and living this crazy life and you know on this crazy ride that I didn't do that. So now in my 40s, I you know now I'm like you know getting into. It. I've been doing this in my 30s, like working out, exercising, eating right, doing all that stuff. But back then I didn't. Also, I think super important. Got to take care of the vehicle that carries that brain, you know. So, that, so when you back in your, I guess, teens or twenties, you're really working out. So, how would you describe that character then, if you were going to pick basically the protagonist of that movie? Mm. How would you describe it to the casting director of who that character should be or embody? That makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, relentless kid who is going to succeed no matter what it takes somebody with grit determination and an ability to work hard and to do whatever it takes in order to achieve the goal that you know he's seeking i guess sounds good to me well thank you shaheen for being on the podcast thanks you for giving I mean, all your insight into it. Amazing journey right there. Hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets. Um, and please, we should have his information in the show notes. So go to the show notes, um, get his book, and hopefully when the time comes about, watch his movie. Thank you again, Shaheen, for being here. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, uh, Vinny, I was telling you, we've got a podcast too. Love to have you on at some stage as well. Uh, oh. Guys, it's called the Hack and Grow Rich Podcast. So you can check that out on Spotify, Stitcher, Google, anywhere where podcasts are found. It's called Hack and Grow Rich. So please subscribe and, and join us. It's absolutely free. And we always love to hear where I think we're up to about 104,000 subscribers now. So it'd be awesome. We'd love to have you guys around. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Everyone, please subscribe, please share and follow Shaheen. Bye guys.